to talk a little bit about is, uh, while they tee that up, is, is give you, maybe wrap up and tie some of the themes that we've heard from some of the speakers together a little bit. You know, we, we gave the name of this event Extreme Information, and I think that's really at the core of some of the challenges that we have moving forward. And what I want to do is discuss some of the dimensions of extremism, if you will, and maybe paint a little picture that there is a uh, lanyap at the end. And um, for those of you that don't know, that's a little bit extra in terms of the impact that if we think about this notion of extreme buyers and extreme governance and extreme engagement, that there is a benefit coming at the end, I think, in terms of the roles that each of us play in our organizations in terms of helping them move forward. So before hopping into the content, I first wanted to thank all of our sponsors. If we could give them a round of applause, they help make this thing possible. Yeah, we must have had like about a, uh, about a gazillion grams of carbohydrates over the course of the last couple of days with all the food, so uh, we couldn't do it without their help. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, folks at Harmony for sponsoring the fabulous party last night. If we give them a round of applause. And really thank all of you all for the trust that you exhibited in tight economic times of coming and getting on an airplane and coming to New Orleans and trusting us with not only your money but with your time. Um, I hope it's been a worthwhile experience for you. If there are ways that we can improve this for next year, and I already know the round tables are not loud enough. I know that you can't hear what's going on, so uh, we got that one. And, uh, but if there are ways that we can improve it, um, please just let us know. It's, uh, this is a, uh, a labor of love. This is kind of the gathering of the tribe in Seth Godin terms. And uh, we really want to make this as, uh, as meaningful an experience for you as attendees as we possibly can. Um, the last uh, person I'd like to thank, uh, well, first I'd like to thank all of my staff. It takes a village to do an event like this. Um, but I particularly want to thank George. And George, if you could just come up here for a second. George is the uh, uh, genius behind all this. She's the uh, blood, sweat, and tears that makes something like this happen. I was going to get you flowers, uh, but I figured you'd only be here another day. They'd just die, um, and you would probably wouldn't take them on the airplane. I was going to um, tell you to go out to dinner, but you're on an expense account for crying out loud, so you're going to do that anyway. So here's some uh, medicinal supplies for the next couple of days. Thank you. So thanks. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So what I want to talk about is I want to give you a little bit of context, first of all, for some of the things that we've discussed. And I want to talk about extreme buyers, I want to talk about extreme governance, and I want to talk about extreme engagement, and as I say, wrap up with the, uh, with the lanya. So first of all, the context. This, I think, is the most meaningful diagram that we have in terms of describing the dynamics that we've talked about over the last couple of days. Um, I believe this is truly a two-humped industry, and it's an industry at a point of some migration, some change. It's at one of those inflection points. You know, we have been through a lot of inflection points in this space. You know, we have gone from microfilm to micrographics to imaging to document management and workflow to enterprise content management, and I think we're really on the cusp of something very, very different driven by this two-humpism, if you will. Now, that's not really the diagram. This is the diagram. And what this is all about, this is something that was in Jeff Moore's book, Escape Velocity. Uh, we do a lot of work. We did a lot of work a couple years ago with Jeff, as many of you know, building up this argument of systems of record and systems of engagement. And this is another view, if you will, through that question of systems of record, systems of engagement, all the dynamics that the speakers have been talking about over the last couple of days. And the way this chart works, just to give you a little bit of an explanation, is if you look at the x-axis, it's the number of customers in any particular industry or business. If you look at the y-axis, it's effectiveness at reaching those customers. And Jeff's contention is that any industry essentially follows this basic model. 
that in some instances you have people that succeed in the sweet spot of complex systems in which there are relatively few customers and very complicated and expensive and high margin solutions. And you also have another sweet spot that's populated by consumer applications and consumer solutions and low margins but high volume and lots of customers. And the interesting thing to think about our space, and this is what I want you to think about in terms of the three extreme points that I'm gonna make, is that our industry for most of its history has been a left hump industry. We have been an industry that has been characterized by complicated solutions to big problems that cost a lot of money and made a huge business impact. And that's really what, been what this space has all been all about. And then what you had happening during the 2000s is you had a couple of trends coming into the marketplace that really changed things around. You had, first of all, SharePoint entering in the, er the mid-2000s in a serious fashion. And you had the established players basically saying, well, that's not content management. That's not going to impact us. Um, that's not really transactional ECM. And so, lo and behold, that old hump shifted to the right a little bit, and all the price points in the industry were totally screwed up as SharePoint attacked the question of content from the perspective of the individual knowledge worker rather than from the perspective of mission-critical, transactionally heavy content processes. You also had Salesforce and other SaaS applications come into that enterprise marketplace, not in our space, but in the broader space. And that opened up this context that, huh, we could run complex systems in a way in which we pay for those systems in a very different way than we ever did before, in a very different way than we ever implemented before. And that was a really, that was a massive change. And we've seen that in lots of other spaces moving forward, that Salesforce example of a SaaS application. Now the thing that was really amazing, and you know, we covered it with, uh, with David, we covered it with Seth, we covered it with a lot of speakers, is this consumer revolution and the impact of the consumer revolution um, on people's awareness of things that were document-y and content-y, if you will, that all of a sudden started popping up on the right hump. So you started seeing things like Google Docs, started things, seeing things like Yammer, started seeing things like Evernote, started seeing things like Dropbox, like Box.net. And so all of a sudden, you had this, this universe, this stew, if you will, um, of solutions that grew up basically in the cloud, that grew up with relatively rudimentary document and content management capabilities that were priced very, very differently. At first they were free for consumers, and then as those guys started migrating a little bit to the left, what you wound up seeing is that those guys all of a sudden started thinking about, you know, hmm, I gotta figure out some way to move off this advertising-driven model and get some enterprises to actually pay for this stuff. So some of those applications wound up being hardened to the point that they actually were relevant business solutions. So the interesting thing about this, and I think it's one of the challenges we have moving forward, is that there is no right or wrong to either of these, to either complex systems land and all those mission critical applications, and there's no right or wrong to simple solutions that provide rudimentary collaboration and document sharing and workflow populated and driven up by the individual knowledge worker. But they are different. They're different in how you pay for them. They're different in how they're delivered. And the other interesting thing is that they're increasingly overlapping with each other. And so as end users, that's the context I think you have to keep in mind. As you think about, you know, lots of times the issues that we talk about tend to sound like they're right and wrong issues. They're not right and wrong issues, they're just different issues. And the interesting thing is that the guys on the left hump deeply envy the people on the right hump. And they are trying to replicate that functionality over in their world. But it's not just there. The people in the right hump deeply envy the margins on the left hump. And they are desperate to move over there. And so that's the stew, if you will. That's the context. That's the environment in which a lot of these issues moving forward, I think, are going to have to be addressed. So I think my main message here, as I say, I think we're on the cusp of some very interesting times. I think that's the focus of this event. That's the focus that we've tried to bring to this association. That's the, that's the thrust, I think, that all of you as information professionals have to deal with, is that these times are, are changing. And you've got to figure out how to start swimming and help your organization start swimming, um, or they're going to sink. And so that's, I think, the context for this notion 
of extreme buyers, extreme governance, and extreme engagement. So let me start with extreme buyers. And this, I think, is a real interesting environment. Because, and you heard it in some of the things that Lawrence talked about, for example. You also heard it in some of the things that Seth talked about, is that there is a big migration in terms of how end users and buyers view IT capabilities moving forward. And I think the most interesting metaphor is the one in the first line there, which is that in the old world, pretty much the current world, we tend to view IT as a railroad builder. And what I mean by that is that we've always viewed IT as they lay down tracks to help us go from point A to point B. They give us the locomotives that we put on the tracks. They give us the boxcars to carry stuff on the tracks. And it's a relatively fixed kind of investment and mindset. And what the business is asking us to do now is think about IT as a taxi company where journeys can be set up in a more ad hoc basis, where they can be driven um, basically wherever you want to go, so long as you're willing to pay the fare. And that's a very, very different metaphor when you start thinking about the nature of the buyer community and then how the solution company intersects with that. So in the old world, you, know, you, start, you looked at IT as basically a source to reduce costs. The, the major executives in the company were largely oblivious to what went on relative to technology. You know, complexity was the source of great job security for IT folks. Most of the stuff was paid for by CapEx, by capital expenditures. And we were in an environment in which pure IT skills, I think of that IT guy on Saturday Night Live a few years back, pure IT skills unconnected to the business or to humanity were driving the train. But we're in a different mode now. There's a much greater demand for reducing risk and creating value rather than just reducing cost. Senior executives, the moment they got that iPad for Christmas in December 2010, the world changed. Whether they are aware or aren't aware or, or competent or incompetent, they think they are. And that's the context in which our IT systems need to operate. And so rather than fixed processes, this emphasis on process agility becomes really key. And I think most importantly, you start to pay for these functions in a different way than you did before. You start, the business is demanding that you pay for IT with operating expenditures, not with capital expenditures. That you have short implementation times rather than long implementation times. And I think what that does in terms of technical skills, and what it also what it does to legal skills and to records management skills and process skills is it demands that those skills be put in a broader context that focuses on connectivity rather than just the pure skills. Now, to make, if this wasn't complicated enough, the migration that's going on is just starting. So most people, when you talk to them, they say that, well, okay, well, at, at some point in the future, various labeled as soon, most of the money is going to be on the right side. But the reality is right now, most of the money is on the left side. And the challenge is that nobody can quite figure out how quickly this migration will occur. It's going to vary by company, by industry, by geography, by all sorts of factors. And so everybody is in a basically a state of flux. Basically, everyone is acting as extreme buyers right now, uncertain of what the future holds. And I think that's going to, that uncertainty, I think, is going to be one of the sources of constancy in an odd way in the next few years as we move forward. So that's point one, extreme buyers. Point two is extreme governance. I wanted to talk a little bit about. So let's just think, you know, we all know about the massive piles of information that are coming at our organizations. You know, here are just a couple of data points. And, and I think we all know this, we've, we've internalized it. I think the data point that really puts it in the most context to me is that when people start saying 40% growth, that doesn't mean a lot. Well, if you're a large organization and you're managing 15 petabytes, what that means is in three years, you're going to have 39 petabytes to manage. That's a big challenge. That's a lot different than 40%. That's a big, big number. And so this number is huge kind of coming down the tracks. The other aspect of this is it's not just the sheer growth of information, particularly for large organizations, it's the context of the growth of that information in terms of the scale of their operations. And so you have that, those two dimensions of scale. You have operational scale 
in large organizations, and you have information scale, and basically colliding to this kind of dynamic that goes on in most large companies. Um, this, is a, this is a huge challenge for companies moving forward. This isn't a simple thing to solve. And so when you look at this, and I think this is also where there's, there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to focus moving forward, when you look at how people are reacting, you know, it's, uh, boy, I tell you, it's, um, it's a little discouraging at times. These are some data points from the, current, from the information governance study that we released on um, Wednesday. And, you know, the two, two things that really, you know, trouble me when I look at this, the first is this question of how are organizations training their people for the change management challenge of dealing with exploding volumes of information. And essentially, 49% are either training nobody um, or they're just leaving, the, it, leaving it to their records management people. And that's the wrong place to leave it. The other one, which is even more challenging, and I, frankly, it's mind-boggling, because this is an AIM sample. Imagine what the real world is like. This is an educated sample. Uh, the real world is much worse than this. In 42% of organizations, the volume of paper records is still increasing. So what does this all translate into? You know, this translates, I think, ultimately, if you take information scale, you take enterprise scale, and you take, you know, kind of a hodgepodge of approaches to solving it, you know, we have basically a hoarder problem in our organizations, particularly large ones, when it comes to information management. And so when you think about, like, what that means, I think there's a couple things that we ought to take away and think about with regards to extreme governance. And again, especially at large organizations at scale. This isn't really a problem for somebody like AIM. I mean, we suffer, you know, our 43-person staff from information overload like everybody else does. But this question of the sheer quantity of information is a huge problem for fortune-scale organizations, whether they're in the public or private sectors. And so the Compliance, Governance, and Oversight Council's done some really good work on this, and they looked at the dimensions of the information that we're saving. And what they basically, the conclusion that they came to was that there were three kinds of information that we really wanted to save. And that's regulatory obligations, information, information tied to meeting regulatory operations. The big one is the stuff that has business value. And then 2% that you might have to save at any particular point of time for legal holds. Well, it doesn't take a math genius to add that up and come to the conclusion that that's 32% is really useful information that we're saving. And the rest of it, basically, is junk. And so I think this is the source of some of the friction in the records management community, because traditionally the records management community has looked at this question from the perspective of what do we have to save, and how do we have to save it, and why do we have to save it, and in what form do we have to save it. There's a parallel question, I think, that needs equal attention, which is this question of defensible disposition, which is, what can we get rid of? How can we get the sludge out of our systems? You know, and how can we get rid of the stuff that basically we don't need? Now, the reason for that, I think, is that you know, some people look at storage costs as the reason for doing this. Um, and this is another strange data point from the AIM survey, where 29% basically say they're just going to keep on buying disks. Um, and whether those disks are, you know, you can have endless debates about whether uh, these storage costs are, you know, they're collapsing according to Moore's law, you know, the, uh, you're going to post it to the cloud, it's cloud you know, storage is going to get cheaper and cheaper, but then the people on the other side say, well, it doesn't really matter because the administrative and management cost associated with storage is going to, you know, dwarf what it takes in order to physically store the stuff. It all really doesn't matter. This isn't the point in terms of getting serious about governance, I think. The real point is this question of what does it mean in terms of business risk? And if you're from a large organization, this is the key question with regards to governance, is what does it mean in terms of litigation cost? What does it mean in terms of customer confidence? What does it mean in terms of protection of your intellectual property assets? And when you look at this from that prism, and this is from uh, that um, article called um, Hoarders by Law Technology News, their conclusion was that the e-discovery related cost of unwanted information is two and a half million dollars per petabyte. That can buy a lot of systems in your organization. And so that's the, that's the fulcrum, I think, that I think records management ultimately needs to twist on in the years ahead. And even if you want to say, oh gosh, you know, well, uh, big data and analytics will discover all sorts of fabulous insights and all that stuff that we previously thought of as junk. Um, say just half of that 
68% is really junk, and the rest of it is um, you know, stuff that might have value. As an organization, you gotta figure out which is which. You gotta figure out what to keep, what to get rid of. Um, because your storage costs will go up, but that's not the point. Your business risk is gonna go up, and that's when it's gonna get the attention of legal and the C-suite in terms of doing something about it. So the last thing I wanted to cover is this notion of extreme engagement. And you know, we've spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, at AIM, we worked with Jeff Moore, built up the argument of systems of record, systems of engagement, and that was about two years ago. If you haven't seen that white paper, it's at aim.org slash future history. And the, the challenge that organizations have had is that that was nice, a nice metaphor for what was going on in terms of the consumerization of IT and how it entered into the enterprise. The challenge is, is that we've, we've, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of bridging the gap between systems of record and systems of engagement. And I'll share just a little tiny story about this um, in terms of your Shoemakers Elves Association here, Shoemakers Children Association. Um, the CEO of this association about three weeks ago said, you know, gosh, we're going to have to collect some cash at the AIM conference. You know, wouldn't it be cool to get those little square things? You know, we're talking about engagement and, you know, we'll connect them to our cell phones and boom, 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 we'll take the processing. Blah, 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 blah. I talked to George and she said, are you, well, he's probably, she probably more was like, are you prepared to talk to Felicia, who's my CFO, who is in the world of systems of record of Great Plains? Are you prepared to talk to Lawrence, who was here yesterday, who lives in the world of our systems of record association management system called Aptify, and get these two things to talk? And of course, the answer was, there's no way we can do that in three weeks. And that's the rub. That's the challenge that people have is that it doesn't make any sense to have systems of engagement that are disconnected to systems of record. And that's the challenge, I think, that we all face moving forward. And so when you think about that, and when you think, what do you do about that, and what's the solution to that, and is there any room for optimism out there in terms of how you deal with this? Um, I think there is, and it comes in the form of the changing nature of collaboration. Now, collaboration, I think, is one of those words that got a bad rap. It's kind of like knowledge management. It was one of those things that I wish we had waited to use those terms for about 10 years until the terms were actually here to do the stuff that we purported to do 10 years ago. And I just wanted to also give a shout out to um, Forrester for, you know, there's a lot of good work in their smart process work in terms of thinking about this question of what collaboration means and how it changes. And Michael touched on this. And the point of this slide is that collaboration is not a one-dimensional thing. That what, what is going on right now is, I think, a much, much richer stew than we've ever had before. And the, the risk of that word social is that that word social almost inevitably lead us, leads us down the path that what we're talking about is Facebook for business. I think we're talking about something very, very different than Facebook for business. And so this, the elements of this stew, you know, obviously mobile is one. And what mobile did is change the nature of collaboration and basically allow, it to, allow you to do it anywhere. Um, consumerization is another element. And the cool thing there, that, those are right hump people in consumerization land. That allowed collaboration to be driven from the bottom up rather than just be driven from the top down. You've got the cloud. That enables us to do collaboration that transcends the firewall. I can't tell you how hard it was about five years ago to try to set up a private site for my board of directors to cross my firewall to interact with each other. It was crazy. We finally went with a right hump solution to deal with that. And then lastly, um, analytics and big data, I think, change the nature of collaboration, where when you start to give those tools to knowledge workers, it starts to provide a context for collaboration. So you add all that up, and I think we're on the cusp of some very, very interesting things. And, and Michael talked about this on that last slide, I, last two slides, I think, in Technicolor. That is exactly what's going on in terms of the wave that is coming in terms of process revolutions. And so I think what's going to happen now is that the combination of collaboration with business processes is actually going to be the bridge that helps us ultimately connect systems of record and systems of engagement. And I think it's going to do it in a couple of ways. The first way it's going to do it is that we all have these very nice business processes that we've written out through our BPM systems and those nice flow charts, and they've got all those little triangles and diagrams and you know, all those branches and all that stuff. 
And it all looks very beautiful in terms of some of those processes. But we all know that the reality of those processes is they don't work exactly like those diagrams because there's all these gray vectors that you know, hop into those processes along the way that essentially represent manual collaboration in which somebody has to go offline, somebody has to go talk to Charlie, they have to get a document, they have to, all that stuff. As collaboration changes, it gives us the potential to make those things more automatic and predictable and get the sludge out of all that gray space. And I think that's gonna be dramatic in terms of helping bridge this gap. The other thing that the cloud gives us is that we start breaking those big processes into pieces. We start breaking them into apps. We start defining best practices. We port those uh, up to the cloud. We start allowing people to pull down best practices and interconnect them with each other. That, ultimately, is the way we're gonna bridge the gap between systems of record and systems of engagement. And I think it's particularly exciting as we move ahead. So the last thing, this is information lanyap, a redefined industry. As I said when we started, I think that our industry has been through a number of inflection points. We started with film, we went to micrographics, we went to images, we went to documents, we went to workflow, went to enterprise content management. I think the ECM era is ending. I think we're at the beginning of a new cusp. Over the last 10, 15 years, since we first started using the term ECM, we have defined this industry as a collection of discrete technologies and we viewed the industry and we viewed content through the prism of those technologies. I think that's changing. I think that's what Michael was talking about, it's what a lot of the speakers have been talking about, is that where we are moving now is an industry that's defined in terms of how you use content, how you use the information that throws, flows through the pipes rather than the pipes itself. And that's a way, way different industry than we've ever been. I won't kid you, it represents a lot of challenges for an organization like AIM, but I think this is the next 10 or 15 years is viewing the content industry through the prism of processes and the prism of applications. I think the exciting thing, maybe this is why Monica was clapping back there, is I think you guys are the, have to be the leaders of that revolution. I think that's where this is all ultimately headed. People that understand that technology is not just about the technology, but the context for technology. They're essentially the information professionals of the future. That's who we want to represent, and that's where we're going to try to take this over the next couple of years. Thank you all very much. So, some of you will remember, last year, we concluded with, um, with this exercise in which we had a golden ticket exercise. And what we did is we had um, a rather horrifying photoshopped Willy Wonka slide that had my face imposed on Willy Wonka and then two Oompa Loompas right next to me. Now, a lot of people came up afterwards and said, that was pretty scary and we would rather not go through that again. Um, but we decided that we kind of liked the concept. And so next year we're gonna be in Orlando, and that'll be really fun. We'll be in the first quarter, we'll be in March, we're gonna work out the dates in the next couple of weeks. And we really hope that you all will be there. And in order to try to start the flywheel going a little bit, um, we have five sets of mouse ears that are taped onto the bottoms of selected chairs throughout the audience. If you find it, basically you get a free pass for next year. So there's a lot of empty chairs, so don't upset all the chairs, but if you want a free pass, and when you find one, give a yell and come down here. We got one right there, give a yell. Who's got them, who's got them? Oh, we got one right here, good, come on up. Come on up around here, you have to put your ears on. We got another one right there. Where's our little handheld mic so we can make sure we know who these folks are? Here we go, Teresa. Anybody else got one? All right. <laughs>
We got one here, we got one here, one, two, three, four. There is one more set out there. Oh, <laughs> all you have to do is introduce yourself. <laughs> who you are. Yeah, you could just say who you are in a minute. Last set of ears. George, you sure there were five? <laughs> Oh, we got one in the back? Come on back here. You guys all get a free pass. Why don't you just introduce yourself and where you're from? Hi, I'm Joanne. I work in the government of Canada. Lori Christine from the University of Virginia. Where? University of Virginia. Oh, wow, cool. Terry Lilly from Gibson Energy in Calgary, Canada. My name, is, my name is Anderson from Brazil. Awesome. <laughs> and one more. There you go. Pam Barnes from the Idaho National Laboratory. Awesome. All right, let's take a picture, Amy. And I have to give you a certificate. So congratulations. Let me give you the certificate. Don't go away. Listen, everybody, thank you so much for being here. If there's anything we can do to improve this, let us know. Safe travels back. We'll see you next year. Here we go. One step at a time.